today. And um, I'm really excited because this particular guest is uh, very special and has a very special place in my heart. But today, oddly enough, um, it's not going to be about what she does. <laughs> it's going to be about what she was. So we're going to have a conversation with an atheist or past atheist. <laughs> My name is Heather Taylor, and our lovely host is Miss Kimberly Krieger. And Kim, I'm going to let you intro our beautiful, wonderful guest. Well, I feel honored to intro Miss Reggie LaBerge because Ms. I should say because she is so extraordinary. You know, we're all about bringing extraordinary women onto our podcast and hearing their story and finding out what they think is truly extraordinary about women. Um, the whole goal of our show is to have women like Reggie on to inspire women like Reggie who are watching. So she's the perfect guest. Here's the deal with her and you guys like buckle up because there's a lot. It's amazing. Amen. She is a wife of 21 years to a musician and leader and an incredible father. She's mother to two daughters who are totally remarkable and a son who's 21, who's also remarkable. She's um, a daughter-in-law and a lover of pets. I find that out when I meet with her in her home and her dog cries in the other room because he can't be with us. Aww. <laughs> and uh, Reggie is also an incredible eight-time number one best-selling author of over 40 books. She Amazing. has gotten stuff done in her life. She's a veteran Air Force Arabic linguist. I don't even know what that is, so we're going to talk about that. Um, <laughs> no. She also is, my favorite part, the FEW International Publications coach. She coaches FEW authors to greatness. She edits their work. She inspires, encourages, and equips and empowers few authors. She's a huge force behind few publications, and I'm so grateful for that. Reggie also is the developer of the Book in a Month course. That sounds really cool. She's, uh, she teaches writing, and um, she is a speaking teacher and mentor. She's a volunteer in multiple ministries, including marriage mentoring, small discipleship groups, welcome ministries, women's events, missions, arts, and the Alpha Course. I think like right now, the Alpha Course is kind of your baby, isn't it? That's the one. That's the Yeah, one. that's your current yeah. baby. Um, you can follow her on bucketlistbookshelf.com. You can find her on Facebook and any other social media outlets. And by the time this show is over, you're going to want to be wherever Reggie is. So welcome, Reggie. Yay! I'm so glad to be with you guys. I love you both. Oh, we love you so much and, and wanted to do this for a long time. I'm so glad we were able to fit this into our busy publishing calendar. Um, and you have graduating children and summer vacations and, you know, it's just a busy time. So thank you for giving us an hour. I'm just so um, enamored by this veteran Air Force Arabic linguist that I somehow didn't know about till I read your bio. But I'm going to go off script and ask, what in the world does that mean? What did you do? And how did you you do it <laughs> oh my gosh I can't believe that's never come up that's so funny um, so essentially when I chose to go in the military and literally like the weirdest decision ever wherever I was a theater girl and like an artist and like you know of course military right you know so um, sure. so bizarre <laughs> Uh, so literally, this is like the worst reason, by the way, to go in the military ever, but it worked out really well. Um, I was in a mall and I was like really bored and I saw like a recruiting station. I was like, oh, no. wonder what that's all about. <laughs> and so <laughs> essentially, I always loved languages. At that point, I was fluent in, in Spanish and um, I thought, hey, yeah, that's something I would be really interested in doing. You know, long story short, I ended up enlisting in the military, and you take this test called the DLAB or the Defense Language Aptitude Battery. Right. And my husband and I joke about this to this day because I got a perfect score on it. And wow. He, wow. He missed one. And so I'm like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so being I'm like one upping your husband. <laughs> <laughs> So, but being like young and arrogant, I say to the recruiter, I'm like, what's your hardest language? And so <laughs> they give me Arabic. Um, yeah. 
And um, my husband, also young and arrogant at that time, although I hadn't met him yet, um, also said, give me your hardest language. And they gave him Korean. So to this cool. joke, to this day, we have like this inside joke about uh, whose language was harder. It's Arabic, by the way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, but yeah, you go out after after your basic training. Um, there's uh, the Defense Language Institute, uh, also known to any veterans out there as the Defense Love Institute, because most people that arrive there single leave there married. I was one of them. <laughs> um, so you go, and it's 63 weeks uh, of five days a week, eight hours a day full immersion in the language you are taught by nationals from those countries. Wow. And yeah, it's not like a, taking a college course where, you know, you get together twice a week and, you know, you <laughs> have some homework. No, you're living this language and numerous immersion events as well in homes and in communities. Um, you really become masterful at uh, reading, speaking, uh, hearing, that's the biggie the language um, and writing it as well. Um, then you spend another six months in Texas where you learn kind of how the military uses that language because just like in English, the way that their militaries speak is not the same way that their civilians speak. So you basically spend six months learning communications and learning how the military uses the language. And then when I got to NSA, um, which is where I served out the rest of my career, I spent the first six weeks in a dialect course where um, in, for, for Arabic, the Arabic that is taught is the, the Arabic of the Quran, and it's not the Arabic that anybody speaks except for like the royals in Saudi, you know, it's just, it's ridiculous. Uh, like right. people walked around speaking Shakespeare, you know? <laughs> So they actually, you're like, great, I've just wasted the last two years of my life learning, you know, a language that's not even spoken. But you go and um, I learned to specialize in the Levantine dialect, which is the dialect that's spoken in Lebanon, Syria, and Jordan. And, um, you know, essentially linguists, they're, they're translators, they're listeners, and uh, then they provide reports to you know, people who need to hear them. Um, I did have a couple of really kind of cool opportunities where like the reports I wrote were part of like the president's daily uh, briefing, which was, oh. was really cool. And um, wow, yeah, That's it, was awesome. great. it was great. My husband, all this time that I was being an Arabic linguist, he was a Korean linguist. And so uh, he actually served for a year in Osan uh, in South Korea. And wow. Uh, before he joined me at NSA. And after we got to this point in our careers where um, we were basically at this juncture, we're like, what do you do? Do we both, we both were, were good at our jobs and we, we liked thing we liked most things about the military. Um, but they were like, okay, well, you'll only have to live apart every other year. <laughs> so we're like, okay, do we want to be married to Uncle Sam or each other? Right. And, uh, we chose the latter. And so I was actually out before 9-11. Um, and so when 9-11 happened and there's like this whole other side story there, um, you know, I didn't really want to get out and I felt really guilty and all this. It was all sorts of whatever, stupid, messy stuff from your history. Right. And oh. so um, when 9-11 happened, you know, all the news who doesn't know squat they're all like reporting this stuff like hey there's a national call for arabic linguists you know if you know oh. arabic you know everybody but they really need you you know serve your country and it's on i didn't care if it was fox or cnn or msnbc it didn't matter they were all like national calls so i have all these family members like regina don't you still know the language well you know i'm literally calling like the office where they're doing the work from you know and i'm like guys you know my clearance is still good do you want me or what and they're like um you know reggie you have blonde hair blonde hair blue eyes you're white as a ghost and <laughs> you're a woman we really have no use for you right now we're looking for like the dark haired guys that could, like you know go you know go blend in in the middle east right. and so like all these people are like didn't you do your job? I'm like, yeah, they're, they're, I'm not the, the national call that they're looking for. <laughs> they don't want me. <laughs> so no. that was the end of my Arabic linguist career. And honestly, I can still read it and translate it very, very slowly with um, 
with a dictionary, but for the most part, I've lost it because when do you use Arabic? You hear it in an occasional terrorist movie where they're like, yalla, yalla, alhamdulillah, you know, and that's about it. So uh, <laughs> every once in a while, I have a phrase here or there, like one of my favorite is akli makli, and I still say that one, and my kids know that one, and it means my brain is fried. Oh, I love it. <laughs> I have to learn that one. Oh my goodness. I totally have to learn that one. That is remarkable. You are just a woman of so many talents. It's just, it blows my mind. As you look back on that very unlikely decision to join the military, and at that time you were not a woman of faith. No. And you were an atheist. And mm -hmm. so you were making decisions based on what you just thought was best for you, What whatever. I don't know what your criteria was, but as you look back on that now... <laughs> you realize like I was over here in theater and I jumped into the military. Do you see the hand of God in that decision now? Oh, absolutely. And I think my husband and I both do. Um, you know, we met at language school and, um, you know, he was going on a journey of his own. He was raised Catholic and uh, was kind of like, he, did, he never was a relational Christian until later in life. And ironically, I'm the one who brought him back to church. Wow. So, yeah, so but yeah, you hear that story. Yeah. But honestly, uh, we do, we see it because, you know, he's from Maine. I was from Wisconsin. We met in California in the military. I mean, it was just such a, and then just all of it and how we each, uh, guided each other and I remember his uh, sister telling me, like, literally, this is like our, like the day before our wedding day. She's like, I just want you to know you will never change him. <laughs> um, seriously, the worst wedding advice ever, by the way. I'm like, oh, thanks, thanks, and welcome to the family, you know, but uh, she's like, I just want you to know you'll never change him. And, and we admitted to each other years later, First of all, both knowing from the start, we're like, that's like really crappy, like marriage advice. Um, we're like, yeah, he changed me and I changed him. And that's kind of how it should work. And if people don't allow other people to change them and to grow them and develop them, they know that would be, that would be really crappy because I don't want to be who I was before I started relationally connecting with people as adults and especially right. my Great point. That's a great topic for a show. I mean, just being yeah. influenceable in a relationship. Um, I was reading an article, this is just a sidebar, but an article by John Gottman who wrote um, Seven Principles That Make Marriage Work, and he can predict divorce within five minutes of listening to a married couple talk about their conflict. Yeah. I mean, the guy is just brilliant. He's narrowed it down to like a science. If you have these pieces in your communication, you're doomed. If you don't, you'll, you'll make it. And he can guide people away from those bad patterns if they're willing. But um, in this article, he talked about how one of the main reasons marriages fail is because husbands are not influenceable by their wives. He said there's something with the male ego that tells them if they allow the woman to influence them, it means they're weak. Right. So there's this resistance against influence. And I loved this article because it just made me think about how the whole point of relationships is for influence. Like that's why God wants people in your life. You, you need to influence them. They need to influence you. And if you have a key relationship in your life and you are closed off to being influenced by that person, mm -hmm. you, know, you just kind of gave the death knoll to that relationship. So it's a side note, but an interesting conversation that we might have to include you in one day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. So backing up to this idea that you were an atheist, can you just take us back? Tell us how that began for you, what that looked like for you. And then I have a ton more questions about dumb things Christian said to you when you were an atheist. I can't wait to get to that part. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, um, honestly, I was, I was raised atheist. Um, my mom came from kind of a, she came from a really abusive background. It was just, and it was also a really strict religious background. It was both of those things. And so uh, it was basically, yeah, yeah. It was, it was a, it was a background of hypocrisy and of pain. And so when it came time for her to raise her kids, uh, you know, we were raised not without, just without God, but we were raised atheist. And that's different than being raised 
agnostic or just kind of not knowing. It's just, yeah. it's just about being raised with a doctrine because there is a doctrine to atheism, which is not just it, which is the real meaning of atheist, which is anti. God. I mean, we were raised anti-God. We were raised to debate it. We were raised to disbelieve it. Um, those who those who were um, Christians or believers of any kind, you know, they're they're stupid. They're weak. They're brainwashed. They wow. just used to have. They have. They don't. They're not strong enough to be moral on their own. You know, all of these different things and it was just it was part of what we believed it was also scientifically what we believed um i was very much a, a big bang believer and a um you know man from monkeys believer and you know all of it you know it's just if it's if it's part of atheism it was what i believed um and with that kind of comes a a lack of moral compass as well and you might believe in ethics and you might believe in good people, but there's still not some of the, the rules of the Bible, the things that are really guardrails and not prison cells. That's what they looked like to atheists was prison cells and not guardrails. And so, you know, well, I can do that. That's what feels good. Or I can do that. That's what I'm living for the moment or I'm living for me. And, you know, I mean, it's just very, um, it's, it's how I grew up. It's, uh, I, I debated it. I knew enough Bible to, to put you in your place, especially if you didn't know yours. Um, yeah, I mean, it was, it, it was completely, it was, I believed it. I believed wholeheartedly and not believing <laughs> and, wow. uh, and, uh, was proud of that, was arrogant of that. And if you weren't in line with that same belief, uh, system, then you were just wrong. Were you ever um, faced with the question or the idea that what you believed also required faith? Well, you know, it's interesting that you say that because that's the, that is actually the sermon that first started to get my wheels turning and first started to get me thinking. And people are like, well, how did you even hear a sermon? Because yeah. if you we're atheists, what are we doing? In church? What are you doing in a church, girl? What are you doing in there? So, um, you know, obviously in retrospect, I can see that God had his hand on me in a few different places. And one of them was in one of my very best friends uh, when I when I lived in Maryland. Um, her name was Stacy, and she, she was really, uh, she always had like a relationship type of faith you know, with God and, and she, um, really our kids were super, super close, very, very close kids. And because of that, you know, we did everything with them and, oh, invite my kids to this Bible camp. Okay, sure. Whatever. They're just playing all day. They're doing games. That works for me. So honestly, I started going to the church because I was bringing my kids and that came because they became a part of the community unity. And that was because my friend and her kids invited them and us. So I would literally sit in the very, 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 very back row of the church so I could like get my kids out of there right away. <laughs> and like, but I was stuck while they were like playing in their like, whatever their day school thing, it's their Sunday school thing. So I was just kind of stuck waiting around there. And so I may as well listen to this guy give his message. <laughs> and so that's kind of how I started hearing sermons. Um, but I'm sitting in the back in this, this sermon, uh, pastor Mike Hilson, he was in a series called ancient faith for a modern day. And the first, uh, part of that series was called what about creation? And he took on evolution and the big bang head on and wow. absolutely like it was all about, guess what? If you are in, if you are in the science camp, if you're in the the Big Bang camp, um, you have faith, and that's where he started from. And he really went through and explained that, you know, nobody was there, nobody was recording it. You know, I mean, for you to really know that this happened, you have faith in that. So, 
that was sort of the start of the whole series is, is wow. breaking down what faith is all about. And, and obviously I'm giving this extremely truncated version because this is, you know, he was raised by a Southern Baptist. So that was a long sermon. Um, <laughs> what are you talking you, about, Reggie? <laughs> were you just like, wow, how long does church go? I mean, were you just like culture shock or what? <laughs> oh, it was, it was definitely, I'm like, people give their whole beautiful Sundays to this stuff, you know, it was like, uh, and now it's so weird because I can't imagine a Sunday without church being a part of it. So <laughs> wow. yeah, it was that whole, exactly what you said. Um, did anybody approach you with, um, you know, faith is needed for atheist beliefs as well and and when i realized that it took several more years before um before i actually fully came around and those were just pride curtains falling down little by little okay. but i like that I, visual pride yeah. curtains yes yeah <laughs> so but up until but that was the series i absolutely credit with starting me thinking that oh, i might be wrong <laughs> <laughs> wow. So um, can you tell us about that pivotal moment when you said, oh, you know, I was wrong and I'm going to say yes to Jesus now. Like he's real. He's yeah. Like how does that happen? And, okay. So and also I'm curious about how that affected your atheist family members. Cause you basically crossed over on them. I did. I joined the cult. Kim. Uh -huh. Traitor. <laughs> Yeah, you did the unforgivable, you know? <laughs> All right. So, you know, honestly, there are, um, you know, everybody has like these aha moments or the hallelujah, you know, the sun is shining down on me. And it was, I would not say that that's what it was for me. Um, so once I had that series that I went through, believe it or not, this is so ridiculous. Okay, so I actually started teaching in the young classroom there at the church, still as a non-believer, mind you. And yes, I had to sign that little statement of, yes, so I believe all this stuff, but come on, I was an atheist. I didn't care that I was signing on. <laughs> Oh my gosh, she didn't care if she Reggie, that is classic. So you're like, yeah, I believe <clears throat> not. My fingers are crossed behind my back. Can yeah, I just like, class? whatever. I'm just going to be in the little classroom with my kids because this pastor out here telling me about like my beliefs take faith. Well, he's starting to challenge some stuff that I believe and I'm not really comfortable with that. So I'm going to go <laughs> hang out with three-year-olds. So I did, I started to hang out with the three-year-olds and I kid you not, this is how I started to learn the Bible <laughs> is by wow. two toddlers. I and believe that. it was just, it, it was so, I mean, I'm telling you like years later when I discovered that David actually beheaded Goliath, I was <laughs> like, what? Wow. I was like, he just threw some stones at him and he fell down and died. Oh, poor Reggie. <laughs> you had the G version of the Bible. Your <laughs> intro was the G version, G rated. It was absolutely so G rated. So funny. Maybe that was for the best. <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm still a little shocked. I only learned a couple years ago that Goliath was beheaded. So. <laughs> Well, I can just interject here that my mom read us a Bible stories that had like the PG-13 version, and I was terrified of God. So you probably had the better, <laughs> you probably had the better setup. <laughs> oh my gosh, it was so crazy. So I ended up, I ended up learning. So here's the, the stage. I'm literally learning the Bible, the G-rated Bible from the three-year-olds. As I'm <laughs> And, but it starts to like, actually, um, I was like, oh, wait a minute. This is a little piece of history. I know this part. I know this from history. Or I know this from science. Or I know this from things that I was taught, like, educationally. And, and for me, that kind of started to break down those mind barriers, you know, because that's where, you know, it was all that arrogant educational elitist crap that was in my head and that, you know, all, everything that you can learn is in books and you can be better and all this stuff. And it's just so, and not that 
I mean, hey, hello, I write and I teach. So obviously I'm a big education proponent, but there are some things that go beyond that. But once those barriers started to come down, then I'd go and they had two services in this church. So then I would go and I'd teach the three-year-olds for one of the classes and I would then sit in the sermon and I'm like, okay, well now I'm not, I'm not as upset by the challenges this guy's talking about. So, so it was really, this was a process. It wasn't a moment. And so I started to learn things and learn things and, but was really still kind of living a very, um, you know, honestly an immoral life and, you know, lots of, lots of junk, you know, and honestly, my husband wasn't, he was on his own journey too. And even though he had been raised very ritualistic, but really it hadn't moved like from here down to here yet for him either. Right. So he wasn't really living he as a Christian either. So you put a couple of people together like that who are both screwed up in their own way and Hey, let's throw them in a relationship and let's see how that works. And, you know, and by the way, we were really, really young when we got married. I mean, so I, I had my, my son when we had our son when I was 20. So, so it was just, and we were, you know, already married and uh, so you could do the math backwards and it's like just on the line maybe, <laughs> you know? but you know, we've always been open with my son about that. So it's not something I mind putting out here in the world. Um, but, uh, but really you put us into this relationship and we were both really screwed up. And so very bad. We ended up at this point, um, separation papers drawn up, you know, we were, um, oh, we hated each other. And I really hate, I really, oh. really hate with like capital H. Like I remember these moments where we would be like this close to each other and screaming at the top of our lungs to each other, like with an inch between our noses. And like, it was, it was awful. We were ready to get divorced. And, um, he actually ended up changing his mind. I still tell him this. I'm pretty sure he love dared me and <laughs> he's never going to admit it, but I'm pretty sure he love dared me, you know, and basically decided, you know, we're not doing this divorce thing. And I remember laying in bed and it was about eight months of just like, all day during the day, it was like numb. It was just like, I felt nothing. And then at night I would just turn in bed and I would just be crying. And I remember I was turned and I would turn and I would lay on like this much of the bed because I didn't want my husband to accidentally touch me, mm -hmm. you know, cause we were back in the same bed. And I was like, I just didn't want him. And I was just, every night was pain and every day was numb. And there was this prayer that I said, and it was the first time I ever prayed. And I was laying in bed and I just said, God, if you're real, please make it stop hurting. So that was like moment number two. Um, and it, it, it was a process from there. And you know, God's like, whatever, make it stop hurting. No problem. That's like little crap. Let me give you all sorts of other awesome stuff too, you know, cause that's just how God works. Um, so that was moment number two. And then moment number three for me, um, I was kind of going on this journey and my husband was recognizing that I was going on this journey and we were being healed and I was being healed and he was being healed. And you know, a million little miracle stories in there that I could just like, I should write a miracle book. Oh, wait, you've done that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Apparently we need to do it again because no miracles were in it, Reggie. <laughs> so just all sorts of uh, stuff going on uh, during that time period. But really it took, it was, it was my pride. That was the last thing to go because I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm in my 30s, I can't get up in front of all these people that I've told forever that God is not real and tell them that I believe now. And so, wow. you know, really deciding that I could give up my pride, that was like moment number three. Wow. And so, so that's, uh, and that's when I chose to get baptized. So, wow. So, did you face the pride issue when you were uh, faced with the decision about baptism or did you say, yes, I want to be baptized. And, and then the pride thing hit your, like, how did that go? 
Um, I had to face the pride issue before choosing to be baptized. Um, I'm in a church that believes in full immersion baptism and it's like, oh my gosh, to be an adult up there and doing this, it felt, it was so like, gosh, it was, this is the stupidest thing to say now. But at the, in the time, I'm like, this is so embarrassing. I was like, I was, I was like, this is so embarrassing. And there's the whole, dang it, I'm smart. I've been wrong all this time. You know, <laughs> it's just, you know, so yeah, I had to face it. I had to. And, you know, it really helped me that, you know, I actually got baptized at the same time my two daughters did. And um. they were young children at the time, old enough maybe to understand, obviously, but younger than me. And it's like, I used to, we had our, my pastor in Maryland used to say, you know, what is all these people taking their kids to church saying, well, we want this for our kids. Why do you want to raise your kids like somebody you don't even believe in? You know, it's, <laughs> I love it. I'm like, yeah, that makes sense. Darn it. <laughs> and so I guess, you know, it was just, uh, I don't know. Uh, it was just finally, God was finally bigger than my pride. Mm. And so that was the point. Wow. When, when I was able to, to choose baptism is when I recognized that and reflected on, on so many things that he did. And, and I was like, well, now it's just stupid not to. <laughs> so what was one of those things, that restoration in your marriage, like was the marriage piece almost taken care of at the time of the baptism where you're like, it's undeniable that God heard my prayer in bed that night? Yeah, it, it, the marriage piece was definitely taken care of. I remember, um, you know, my husband and I having this conversation. This was maybe, gosh, this was like six, eight months after we had. Um, so we basically, we moved across the country, you know, when we, when, when everything fell apart. We're like, we can't even restart here. Oh. Um, and so we did. We moved across the country. We came to Wisconsin, which what a blessing. We, we just, uh, we love the state. I grew up in this state, but um I also, I didn't come back to the exact same area I grew up in. And it's just, oh my gosh, I just, I love where I'm at. And home is, I guess, where home is for everybody. But for, for me and my family, it is, it is Wisconsin and it's just so much blessing there. So we, we ended up moving back here and yeah, the marriage was fixing and fixing slowly. And here we are like six, eight months after this move. Um, and my husband got frustrated with me. And he was frustrated, not with me, with us and with the progress of, yeah, we're not back where we were yet, you know, because there are things that get broken. Trust gets broken. And just when you start to believe or when God's in the mix, it's not like those human things go away. They're still yeah. there. You still got to fix them. You still got to deal with them. Um, and it was going slow. And I said, and he's like, I don't know, maybe this wasn't the right thing. And I said, no, I'm like, you would not give me a divorce. So you're just going to have to go through this crap with me and we are stuck in it and it's going to get better. And he's like, but we're not back to normal. I'm like, I don't want that normal again. Screw that. I would like better than normal, please. Yes. <laughs> and, and it was like, we had this like, fight and I'm like you wouldn't quit so I'm not quitting either and I don't care if you're miserable we're getting through this <laughs> and it was funny though because honestly that's really where he had been when he when he was all in earlier and I just kind of had to remind him of that so at this point the, the marriage was fixed but it was you have to know I mean it was so much more than that and you know I've uh, since becoming a believer I've had the opportunity to witness it in other people, but in reality, the idea that, God, it's a whole change. You really are a new person. It's just every, it felt like everything I touched after, after really reaching out to God was blessed. And even the negative things were blessed. And um, so it wasn't, yes, the marriage was a miracle, but so was, you know, connecting in community was a miracle. So was my business ended up being blessed, which was just 
that was one of the biggest surprises of all. The fact that, you know, I, when I first started to believe, it was like, okay, well, my, my believing piece, that's going to go over here in this little silo, and now church is <laughs> my life. You know, but that was it. And then there was like, oh, and I'm a businesswoman, um, you know, a writer and an educator, you know, schools and the art industry. That's where God lives. Of course, everybody thinks that. <laughs> so I kept them very separate for a long time. And when I started to um, publicly open in my business with the whole, yeah, I, I start my business from a point if I'm a Christian first. And I, I will openly tell anybody that in a conversation. I said, it doesn't mean I, I only work with Christians, but it means that this is the perspective that I'm working from. And this right. is what you can expect from me as a result of that. And I wore like a cross to the conference and everything. And that was what I led with. Oh my gosh. I got my first traditional publications after that. I got like, I have more clients that come to me than I can keep up with the quality of the clients that that I get to work with are are much more honorable as well um the uh, so my business was blessed my home was blessed the my children were blessed my marriage was blessed it was not just the marriage that's why I say when I told God I didn't even care honestly I didn't even care about the marriage when I said that prayer I just wanted to me 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 I personally want to stop hurting and that's when God was like, yeah, that's nothing. <laughs> Whatever. Let me show you what I got in mind, you know? Yeah. So that's where he moved. Wow. So amazing. I didn't know a lot of those parts and pieces to your story. So how long has it been since you were baptized? What year was that? So I was baptized in 2009, in December of 2009. So we're going on, we're, we're at eight and a half years. Wow. That's amazing. And so what, who was the most surprised or angered by your decision to become a Christian? How did that go over? So honestly, anyone who knew me, um, especially from my youth, would, was totally surprised. Um, a lot of them, you know, when you old classmates and stuff find you on Facebook, sometimes they still find me and they're totally shocked. They're like, what? Because I was like so argumentative. I wasn't this happy little atheist over here and letting you do your believing thing. No, I, I would like bring on the fight and I would debate and I was just like passionately hostile. I really passionately I, hostile. Yep. <laughs> I caught that too. <laughs> I'm going to keep that phrase in my pocket because I know a lot of passionately hostile people. Okay. <laughs> I was, I was, I just wanted to put them in their, their place. And, and again, I knew enough of the Bible to be able to debate it. You know, of course, retrospectively, I'm like, yeah, without wisdom of it. But this is why you just don't go into an argument unarmed, man, because there's going to be somebody out there who's going to take you down. And, and that was me. And I would not be surprised if I probably, you know, convinced a couple of people at least to become doubters or skeptics. Yeah. Um, as far as angry, I don't think that was really it. Um, I think what I experienced from people was either they didn't believe it. They thought I was a hypocrite because maybe my whole life I'd lived this other way. And they're like, really, you know, you're a Christian now. Great. You know, welcome to the club. I know who you were in high school. You were not a Christian. And so there were the people that were like, either thought I was a hypocrite or they were skeptics of me and of my change. Um, or there were the people that totally thought it was a cult. And that's where a lot of my family, I think, fell into, you know, um, you know, my, my parents who were still unbelieving and um, one of my sisters and, you know, other extended family that really just still were like, how did this happen? Oh, it must be from that military you got brainwashed. And <laughs> Yeah, because that's their mission. Make everyone Christians. <laughs> yeah, so so funny. So, yeah, so that's kind of how it was. It wasn't. It wasn't anger. It was definitely disbelief, um, skepticism, and and you know just a misunderstanding of what what it really was all about. 
Yeah. Wow. That is just, oh my gosh. I cannot imagine being like, so I was raised in church. I had Jesus in my heart from the, you know, little age and I lived like a heathen, like an atheist for a while, but I knew the truth inside that, you know, I was vehemently arguing against abortion while I was a teen mom. I mean, figure that one out. <laughs> so like, I'm like, no, there are morals. I just don't use them, but I should, you know, so <laughs> oh, that's amazing. So, you know, back to this idea of what I said earlier that like, I couldn't wait to find out what are some of the dumb things people said to you to convince you? Yeah, look at she's embarrassed for the cringeworthy moments. With totally. Yeah. Totally cringeworthy. Yeah. So honestly, um, ugh, seriously, like I would have come around so much earlier in life if, like, <laughs> if you people had a clue. <laughs> Stupid Christians of God, because they don't know what the heck they're doing. So. Like the, um, first there was the whole, I, the very first time I had a debate about God not being real. I kid you not. I was in the third grade. So this is wow. how I knew it that early that God was not real. Um, and it, my friend who was trying to debate me said was, we were talking about, you know, big bang and, and stuff. And, and I said, uh, she says to me, well, how did all that stuff that came together and created the Big Bang, how did that get there? And I said, well, it was just there. She says, nothing can just be there. And she says, well, and I, so I said, well, how, does, how did God get there? And she said, he was just there. <laughs> I'm like, so she's like, I'm supposed to just accept that, of course, the creator is always there. Well, hello, I don't believe in him. And so it was just, I, I may still be, I was still friends with her, but I'm like, you're, <laughs> you're <so good. laughs> I mean, really, I was like, you're it's such circular logic. So then the same similar kind of thing where Christians have this tendency to argue with things that they accept as truth and others don't, Yeah, that came up, you know, with the resurrection, you know, well, how can you not believe in the resurrection? It's in the Bible. I'm like the Bible. Why are you arguing to me about right? No, no, no. It's historically, it's a historical fact. That's the, the, the angle. But it's not even that. They have to get me to find, get me to believe in the Bible. Right. I, I, right now, I'm looking at that Bible as an atheist. Oh, that's such a cool little book of mythology. That's right up there with, you know, all the Greek <laughs> gods and the Rome god. Roman yeah. god. I mean, yep. It really is. I didn't look at it as any different. Um, so to argue me the Bible when I don't accept the Bible as fact is it's again, it's kind of circular. And um, I actually pulled up a verse on this one because there's this verse. It's a, it's one Corinthians two, um, 11 to 14. And I'll actually just read that for the 14 part, but you should look at the whole thing. It says the person without the spirit does not accept the things that come from the spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the spirit. And that's what Paul is telling us. He's like, hey, nobody's going to believe this stuff. They're going to think it's foolishness because they don't have the spirit to understand it. So right. um, again, I sort of using the Bible without first taking the time to maybe prove the Bible. And that's a whole thing that you can do. Um, so what other, would you suggest, you know, is, is that what you're saying that before you dialogue about what the Bible says, you have to make a case for why the Bible is valid. But if you, absolutely. won't that also just sound like you want me to believe in the Bible and I just don't? I mean, how, what would you say now as a Christian talking to an atheist to give the Bible validity? So you can't have that conversation with an atheist anyway before you have a relationship with them, which is actually kind of like on the flip side, the number one thing that I think to talk to an atheist, you have to have a relationship. Yes. Right. If you have a relationship and they see you living a certain way, then you have that opportunity to talk to them about the Bible. And there are more resources out there. Like they have this whole science, and I'm going to forget the word, but it basically measures how accurate a a work is based on how far is the writing from the people who wrote it, um, how many copies of it were in existence, how many originals were in existence, all these different things. Well, nobody ever questions Homer, Aristotle, Plato, all these different people, but 
they question the Bible. And when you look at this science of how they judge old texts, the Bible blows all the rest of them like out of the water. And so, you know, there's stuff like that. You really have to, I think that the majority of believers, every, I think when we become Christian, we've moved God from here to here. So all of a sudden we become so heart focused. We try to have these heart focused arguments. Atheists aren't living there. They're still up here. So we're always making these philosophical heart arguments instead of breaking down the mental and educational barriers so that we're able to see that, that history and science and uh, social studies and cultural studies and philosophy can live in the same world as the Bible and God and Jesus. And I'm thinking wow. of Josh McDowell and Lee Strobel, both yep. avid atheists who really were on a mission to disprove God was, Jesus was real and the Bible was true. And through science and through history, they both became believers because the, the evidence was undeniable. So through their head, as you're saying, not the heart, through the head, there was a case. And then Lee Strobel went on to write the case for Christ and the case for, you know, other doctrines yeah. in the Bible, uh, really compelling stories. And so, you know, there's lessons to be learned there when we're talking to non-believers. I love that. Don't talk to them about the heart of faith. Talk to them about the science and the facts. And there's so much, I mean, God is the God who created science. He's going to have scientific evidence to back up his truths. He invented science. He invented math. You know, he invented the brain, like all of it. He invented logic and reasoning and intellect. He's not worried about arguing with an atheist. We are. (laughs) God's like, I know how to reach them. Just chill out, everybody. You know? Absolutely. And if you're somebody who's proof, another one uh, who's looking for proofs and evidence, another one who's a great one to read is J. Warner Wallace. He approached it from the point of a detective. He was a lead detective. He had worked for years and years on even, um, what's the the famous um, show? CSI? No, it was the, um, I don't they go, uh, they find uh, America's Most Wanted. Oh. And so, um, yeah, he was evidence-based and he did the same thing. He's like, well, let me see the evidence around this. And same thing that like Lee Strobel and these others have done where it ended up going from being a a non-believer to a believer because he did the study on his own. And I find that again and again and again, um, science proves the Bible as opposed to, and the other things that we don't know yet, it's just that science hasn't caught up to the Bible yet because God knew him a long time ago. And one of my favorite examples of that is the, the way that the Bible is written. It's in this metaphorical language and literal language and poetic language. And one of the lines, um, talks about, you know, the trees clapped, you know, so we as, you know, just regular old humans were like, oh yeah, we think about it the way that the wind blows through the leaves. It does kind of sound like applause. That's pretty cool. You're thinking that was just chosen in this metaphorical way. Well, science has now proven that the sound of wind blowing through the leaves in a tree and the sound of an audience clapping have the exact same looking sound wave. And so, again and again wow. and again science proves the bible and right. so the bible doesn't have to prove science <laughs> so it's just coming around so yeah i really think that having a relationship breaking down those mental barriers um once you break down the mental barriers then you can break down those personal barriers the things that are after the belief barriers because belief barriers are mental Personal barriers are the things that now you can start talking heart stuff. Now you can talk about people's personal testimonies yeah. and, and seeing people's stories. Now you can paint a picture of hope in the future for this life here, not just eternity because, hey, if I'm an atheist, I don't know about eternity yet. So right. we have to have that discussion. So talk to me about how my life is, is going to be better here. Mm. Those are how you can really actually get an atheist thinking. I love I like that. It. You actually said in your notes, paint a picture of hope in a new life here first, then in eternity. And um, who doesn't need that? 
I mean, Christians right now, I know a lot of Christians who are suffering, they need a picture of painted of hope in a new life because right. they're struggling. They, they believe in the Lord, but everybody needs hope. So if right. we just started with like, what if our conversations with people um, were surrounding the topic of hope and not arguments over beliefs? You know, we have yeah. this saying in, in my other business, when you're trying to reach people, when they need help and they don't know they need help, or they need something they don't know they need, our saying is poke their pain. You know, what if somebody would have poked your pain and said, God can, God can heal your painful heart. God can set you free from that, you know? Um, you might have been like, yeah, I'm not so sure about the God part, but man, I felt a little hope for a second there that maybe I could live without this pain. You know, mm -hmm. like that's just beyond human argument. It's beyond intellect that's where um there can be a little ember that's you know it's like a slow burn but it's it, it's exactly how you came to the lord just a slow uh, an ember that was fanned into flame over time it wasn't an explosion you know yeah. and you don't have to talk about it you know you said rather than all of these little beliefs i think so many people get caught up and passionate over these tiny little elements in the bible and don't even engage in that stuff. I mean, if back in my atheist days, if you wanted to really talk to me about Noah's Ark and whether or not it happened and what proofs, I'm like, oh, I'm going to come up with all sorts of stuff. You are <laughs> focusing on the wrong thing. Let me believe first and then come to terms with all these other pieces of the Bible because in reality, that's not a salvation issue. Right. right. One salvation issue. One. And that's Jesus. So why are people poking at all these stupid little parts of the Bible that we as believers have to like study and understand and dig in on with the wisdom of the Holy Spirit? So you ain't going to get there with a non-believer, you know? That's poking right. So true. Yeah. So, so get to the heart of the matter, which is the salvation issue. And that's yep. the only one that matters. Yep. So I had a conversation recently with one of my many offspring who began the whole, I don't know if God's real, you know? And, and so um, several of my children have been on their own journey of discovering truth because a, a big part of our story in the early years was hypocrisy as well. You know, we had all this Jerry Springer dysfunction at home, but we're like serving God in church, you know? And, whatever. So, you know, when they grow up, they've got to figure it out. Like, is God like my parents? Is he trustworthy or not? Like, is he fake? Is he phony? And it's easier to just not trust him. And also, you know what? I kind of like living my own life. So it's really easy to say God is not who my parents says he is. So this child of mine is like, yeah, you know, like who says the Bible is the infallible word of God? And who said God is like the God of the Bible and that Jesus is God? And, and I just said, can I, can I just stop you right there? Because I've had this talk with some of your siblings before. <laughs> and I just said, Here, here's what I'm going to say to you. Don't hide behind, is God even real? Because you want to live for yourself. Right. I said, if anybody has seen God show up, it's my family. You saw miracle after miracle after miracle growing up in, the, in my home, and you know God is real. You've experienced him touch you. You've even ministered to other people in his power. I said, so we're not going to talk about whether or not he's real. If you want to have a real discussion, why don't you start talking to me about why you'd rather live for you than live for him? Mm -hmm. Because this is a smoke screen. And he goes, wow, yeah. <laughs> you're good mom <laughs> and I was just like I it took me a while to figure out the smoke screen like as a mom I was going oh my children don't know God's real and I'm like yes they do I was just like look back over our life they know God is real and I looked at him and I said now all that aside I get why you're afraid to trust him I said that part I get I go so I will pray for you that you can learn through experience that the God of the Bible is trustworthy. I said, that will be my prayer for you from now on. Wow. And he was like, mom, wow. You know, and I'm just like, you know, you got to figure it out. So it's like conversations with a fake atheist. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> That's what it was. I'm like, don't you pretend to be an atheist in my house. <laughs> So anyway, I don't know if I did that right or wrong or what, but I was just like, you know what? Yeah, I've heard this before and I got really nervous about it. And you're not going to get the best of me with this talk. So, yeah. I think another thing we can do is, you know, show the love first because, you know, Joyce Meyer is always saying the be a Christian all the time and use your words sometime. And I think because I have several atheists in my family, in my life, and they're for, and I, I always, I'm not trying to categorize, but <laughs> my family, I mean, the goal is to prove me wrong. That's all they want to do. And they're very aggressive and angry to the point where I'm like, are all atheists just out to prove that we're wrong? Why are they so much louder than me? <laughs> I'm not even standing in my corner preaching. I'm just sitting here and you guys are like, ah. <laughs> so I kind of think, yeah, over the years, they've just learned to shut up because I'm not going to interact with it. I'm like, you know, you're entitled to your opinion. I'll pray for you. You know, my brother, especially, he's like, oh, well, let's hope science doesn't devour you. And I said, and I'll pray for your soul. So we're even, okay? <laughs> you're not going to change their mind by th just exactly what Reggie was saying. But I find as they watch me change, it becomes a little bit more curiouser and curiouser. You know, it's like what's going on with you? You're more calm. You're not as worried. Are you okay? Is everything good? You seem happy. Why are you always happy? And then they almost try to drag in God because they think that's going to be the ultimate fight. But, you know, as I get older and as I get more sure of myself and have the Holy Spirit with me or the HS, you kind <laughs> of uh, just learn to love them through it and pray for them because they're going to start coming to you, not so aggressive, but with more questions. Yep. So I totally agree with what Reggie's saying, but I also think sometimes not even trying to argue with them, just cut them, cut it out right there because I'm sorry, but you guys, you atheist people that I love very much, you're very aggressive. You're out to show you're right. And I don't know why, because in the end we'll find out. <laughs> And the worst that's going to happen to me is I'll just be dead, but you oh, don't no. believe in God. <laughs> no, stop. Stop. You're doing one of the things. Oh, no. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, like, seriously, this is, this is my third thing. So, Miss Heather didn't read my notes. So <laughs> I read most of them. <laughs> or maybe I just didn't okay. agree. So, this was, like, my third biggest, like, cringe is the whole look, if I choose to believe and I'm wrong, I lose nothing in death, but I gain hope in life. But if you choose to believe, to not believe, and you're wrong, well, you don't have this hope and you're going to hell, which you didn't just say that right now. Yeah, I don't say that. <laughs> but guess what? That's what I heard. So like, it's like when, when you're, when people used to say that, they're like, whatever. I'm not losing anything if I believe, but what do you lose? I'm just like, all I'm hearing is you just told me I'm going to hell. I'm like, I'm, I'm out here. I'm a good person. I volunteer in the PTO. I love my kids. I'm good. Why am I going to hell? So that's like, that's totally one of those other cringe arguments I used to get from. But why does it bother you if you don't believe it? That's what I don't know. I mean, I get what you're saying and I can see, but to me, all I hear is like, I'm being convicted. You know? um, I know that, but I think that what people are hearing is they're feeling, they're like, okay, so you're going to threaten me into believing? Oh, okay. okay. What is yeah. that do to me? I see that. I mean, I, I don't threaten me I don't to agree say, with it, but I totally see it. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, you're, you're threatening me into believing, or you're saying like, come on, Reggie, the sky is green. Can't you tell? Because honestly, that's the same thing that's the same level of conviction that the atheist has. Like you're yeah. just telling me fine. Just if you, you don't have to believe, but you're going to be the one to suffer from that. Well, to me, you're like telling me to believe that the sky is green. You know, I mean, I'm not, I feel judged. I feel threatened by yeah. that. And it can shut down my willingness to have the conversation. But I do feel 100% in agreement with you that don't have it if it's just an argument. If they're out to just try to try to get in that argument and try to get debating with you, what is the point in that conversation? There is none. Yeah. I agree with you on that. Yeah. 
But that's kind of where my whole, the only reason, and I have said it before, so I apologize, but the only reason it ever comes up is because I'm under attack. My belief is under attack. My, I'm stupid for having this. And it gets to the point, especially with the people that I love, why are we having this conversation? If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. It just doesn't matter. But why are you so worried? About I feel like they're out to prove they're right more than prove that I'm wrong. You know, so to me, I find silence is my best way because <laughs> I have a very aggressive family anyway. But no, I would never try to convict someone by going, well, you're going to burn in hell. But when someone's convicting me, I will let them know, you believe what you believe, that's fine. But I believe I'm going to heaven. So you're not, you know, it's not a threat to me. And if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But if you're wrong, that's your problem. So sorry, <laughs> but I'm still sticking with it. I, I mean, I just don't feel like, I think atheists are trying to recruit more people than any Christians I've ever met. And that's just my experience, but they're very aggressive and they're out to prove you're stupid. And in my case, I'm not, I'm going to help you win. If I open my mouth, I'm just going to keep my mouth shut and then you can figure it out on your own. <laughs> you are a hundred percent right, Heather. And you would have hated me in my atheist days. I'm telling no, you, never. right. I would have thought you were stupid. Yeah. I would have been trying to recruit you. I would have been debating you. And that's why it's so important to learn those other things, like building the relationship with somebody, which you've already said that you're doing. You're like, you're seeing that the more that your family is seeing the way that you're living, the more that they're starting to maybe ask some questions like, hey, why are things different for you? And you're and and I think you can say things back to them in a very non-threatening way. You can be like, you know. Faith is just really working for me. Yeah. And if you ever want to have a, and, and say this to them, and I had people say stuff like this to me, if you ever ha want to have a real discussion and not a debate, but just kind of hear my story, mm -hmm. I'd be more than happy to tell you. Oh, absolutely. That's yeah. I, I really do feel like love is the way to get in. Even with my brother, when I first moved here, I mean, I was just the idiot, you know, because only idiots believe in God. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> And this was out me without me ever asking, by the way. This is just, I'd go, oh my gosh, thank God. And you go, there's no God. It's like they go out of their way to let you know. So, you know, I've learned, I have, like I said, I have a very aggressive family. I know uh, I'm not going to change their mind <laughs> and I don't try. But now I'll, you know, when he's sick, I'll go, you know what, I'm going to pray for you. And now he just goes, thanks. <laughs> So it's like, hey, they know that's, that that's improvement. That's it is. Improvement. I'm totally happy with it. Yeah. It takes time. It takes so much time. And believe me, there are people in my family, Heather, that I have said, whatever, that's a lost cause. I'm giving that one to God. And I'm not <laughs> saying that. I'm not saying that out of love when I've said that. But you know what? When I say that, all of a sudden God starts doing stuff. And I'm like, oh, cool. Thanks. Exactly. <laughs> The fact that he's just saying thanks, that's that's a really huge difference. And it you, is, yeah. You really got to trust God to to do his part in this too as we continue to pray him through. Absolutely. I trust me. God does a lot more talking than my lips do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love it. Well, Reggie, one of the questions we ask all of our guests is what do you think makes a woman extraordinary? And who is an extraordinary woman who's had a major influence in your life? <sighs> okay, so I just think, um, I think women are made extraordinary. Um, and that, you know, what makes them be extraordinary is just to be and to embrace who they are and to cho always choose, wake up choosing the very best things uh, in themselves. Uh, wake up and choose the best part of yourself and, and go forward with that. And if, if you're constantly doing that, like you're already made extraordinary. And so if you're choosing those pieces inside of you every day, love and gratitude and compassion and um, forgiveness and choosing to engage the gifts that God gave you, the extraordinary just happens because that's how we were made already. Mm, um, beautiful. Gosh, an extraordinary woman in my life. I, I, when you saw this, when you wrote this, I'm like, it is a very hard question for me because I feel like part of this second half of my life here in post post baptism, post believing has been, I've really surrounded myself with women and 
so many of them are, I just can't imagine not being, I can't imagine being in a community that wasn't like filled with these incredible women. And so I have my own daughters as they've grown up, obviously are the first people that come to my mind and they're every day they're better than me. I'm like, man, sometimes I feel so petty compared to them. Like when they get, when they get like attacked or something, I'm like, who is it? Come on, mama bears out. I'm gonna take them down. We're gonna have a meeting. And it's like, I'm ready, you know? And my daughters are like, no, we're gonna let this one pass, mom. It's okay. Wow. They said what they needed to say and I'm going to just absorb it and go on anyway. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that's like, you're so much better than me. I suck. Oh. <laughs> So yeah, my daughters, they come to mind, but seriously, it's, I can't pick one extraordinary woman. <laughs> like I have an older sister who's just like, so my, you know, we are each other's sounding board in, on so many things in family and in business. I have the few authors that I've gotten to work with who have just, uh, it is so like my testimony is in new light after the, the last, you know, year that I've been working with few because I see these women and I'm like, Oh my goodness. I had it made. I didn't go through half of this crap that these women went through. Yeah. And so they've put my own story in a new light. And so the few authors and, you know, you, and I have, you know, women in my, my Bible study groups at church who are just like, you know, I always said my, my very best friend, it's funny. Like I always kind of identify in my head like this. It's like, you know, your best friend when I had like all these people that came to help me decorate my office, when I got my downtown location for my business and my best friend was the one who showed up when I had to close that storefront. Oh, I'm like, yeah, that's love. That's what. And so I seriously like the few women, my sister, you know, um, my daughters, my, my, the women I'm friends with at church. Um, I can't pick one. I can't. <laughs> well, you are blessed. That's awesome. I mean, what a good problem. I have too many extraordinary women in my life to choose one. That is that's great wonderful. Problem. So, um, you know, few empowers women to live extraordinary lives and tell their stories. You are a huge piece of helping women tell their stories. You're so good at helping women learn how to tell it in a compelling way, how to write it, how to publish it, and how to, how to do it in a professional way as well, even if they have absolutely no experience. So that's amazing. But why do you think it's so important? Like, what about that mission excites you? Why is it so important for women to tell their stories? Good question. <laughs> going back to like that lovely science stuff that breaks down my mental barriers. So women's brains are actually biologically made for storytelling. Um, our brains are actually, um, we have more of the gray matter as opposed to the white matter, which is the matter that causes connections between things. Sorry, I'm getting all nerdy on you. Oh, I um, love it. It causes connection and stories are made for creating connection between the writer and and the reader or the, the listener of that story. And so literally our brains are biologically created to learn from storytelling. And uh, I think that that's the most powerful form of communication to engage us as engage us for change, engage us for transformation, engage us for development and growth. And, you know, if you have a story in your head, it is doing nothing. It is doing nothing. And I'm like, okay, we have the most powerful connection tool like at our disposal and you're sitting there and not using it. I'm like, what, why, why would you not do that? You could literally change somebody's life. It is the number one tool for development and growth and transformation and change. And if you don't tell it, it's like, Oh my gosh, I just don't even get it. It's like you've got a nail to put in a wall and you just leave the hammer over there. It's like, let, do it, let it do its job. Tell your story. 
I love that. Oh my gosh, I have to get you in, in some kind of video. Oh, I, guess that I, passion. <laughs> I love that. Such a passionate plea for women to tell their stories. And I know as you're talking, I'm thinking of a small handful of women in the few circle who are not ready to tell their story. Tell your story. Yeah, and they have their reasons and their reasons. I get it. Like it's logical, but they don't get what you're saying. They don't get the power that's going to come from them telling. They're they're kind of fixated on the fear, what they're afraid of in telling their story. And so, um, I just think it's so awesome how you said that. That you have the most powerful tool for transformation at your fingertips. And the people you want transformed the most, i.e., your closest family members they're the ones you're afraid to tell the story to and like ironic you know incredible amazing so thank you for that reggie i'll probably have to watch this back and write all that out and put it on my <laughs> website amazing all right last question so you are such an accomplished writer publisher you're so creative what are you currently working on and what what would be your dream project Ooh. Okay. Seriously, you asked this question. I think I gave you a list back. <laughs> so yeah, little list, little list. I I I um, I'm writing so many things. So first of all, obviously the big few projects right now. We just kicked off a few words of comfort for the grieving, and um, I'm loving that. And I think you still have a couple of slots left. So those of you women who are like, I don't want to tell my story, and now you know why. Here's one of the projects that you can come in on. Perfect. I love the few collaborations. So we have that book and we have uh, the breakthrough effect starting soon. And, you know, I'm, I, I look forward to, to continuing on the few collaborations as, as the coach there. But I also, I have a, a young adult series that um, a traditional agency and publisher is looking at. It's a five book fantasy action series, believe it or not, like young adult is really like my passion. Oh, wow, that's awesome. Yeah, I love, I love young adult and, and children's books. So I have some picture books and chapter books, some that are already written that I just need to, you know, my own projects a lot of times end up taking the back burner. Um, I also have had kind of a dream project of doing these things called Shakespeare shakeups where I use the Shakespearean writing, to, but to create other plays um, because he's, you know, second to God only when it comes to writing about like everything. Um, and, you know, obviously a lot of my own ministerial writing as well, whether it's devotionals or I have a lot of spoken word projects that I'm doing. And then the big dream is I've always wanted to write for like a single season. Um, and I say a single season or one series on television or like a mini series because I don't really want that life. Those people that do it for like seven to 10 years, they get so burnt. But I would love the opportunity to do it for like a single season where you get to really um, work with and watch a character develop from, from that introduction yeah. until and all the way through their transformation. And it's a little different. I, I love the whole partnering and collaboration process. And when you get to work <clears throat> with actors like because I actually began in playwriting when you get to work with with actors they put so much of themselves into that that the writing kind of becomes this collaboration it becomes yes. influenced by that person who's developing it and so the idea of being able to work on a series in a transformation and in partnership with somebody else that that's like the big dream I don't know if it'll happen one day but you know, wow. who knows? That's awesome. That's, I have that same dream. I want to do that one day. Oh, that would be awesome. Yeah. We could do it together, Heather. I was just thinking we should just totally write our own show. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> oh, that's so great. Well, Reggie, I'm just so blessed and honored. And I feel like I know you in a much deeper way. And we've had a great time getting to know each other in this last year. But your story is remarkable. Your heart is beautiful. And I'm just so grateful that you're a part of the whole few mission. You're just um, a really, uh, you're a blessing from the Lord. And I'm so grateful for you. Thank you. I'm so glad I got to be here with you guys having our coffee together, you know. Yes. So I, I think here I, I was... mug today, finally, <laughs> real friends, real life, Ooh, real talk. There we are. 
And I'm so excited to, you know, give, offer this tool, like this podcast is a tool for people who have loved ones who are atheists, you know, that they're, Reggie, you gave us brilliant, brilliant talking points, perspectives that Christians do not have. If they've never been an atheist, they don't get it, you know, so Very true. Yeah. shedding so much light on this subject for us. And um, I just pray that, you know, God continues to bless you the way you said, like everywhere you go, he blesses you. I pray that that never stops until the day you meet Jesus face to face. Thank you for that prayer. Yeah. So uh, Heather, did you have anything, any questions or anything you wanted to add? Uh, no, I'm, I'm just completely in awe of Reggie. I think she knows that. I just admire everything she's doing. She's amazing. <laughs> And I love your strength and I love that you have such conviction behind what you think and what you do. And I'm so glad we won you over to Christianity. <laughs> you'd be a hell of a fighter for atheists. So I'm glad to have you on our side, baby. Right. This is a total W for Christians everywhere. <laughs> Woo! Yeah. Oh, well, Reggie, have a blessed day. I will talk to you soon because I know you've got some edits to do on my book today. <laughs> Yeah, got to get my red pen out. Oh, oh dear. Rhinoceros blood. No. Yeah, I'm not I'm not worried about the red pen anymore. It's much more gentle coming from Miss Reggie. So, Amen. she puts compliments in too. She does. She's good. Yeah, she makes sure you you know what's good and I love this new line. It's become one of my favorites as I was going through all my edits. Um this wording is clunky. I was like that's perfect because I like wouldn't, I didn't know how to describe like this doesn't sound right, but I love the word clunky. Like clunky. you want it to flow and you just picture a car with square wheels. It's just <laughs> clunking down the road. Like we need to give this car round wheels, you know? So, so just to um, clarify, when I tell her that it's clunky, I'll usually also make a suggestion on a different way it can go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and and her suggestion is usually brilliant. Too, like, this wording is awesome. So <laughs> She does. She'll put on the side, love this whole paragraph. And um, one, one of my favorite things that you added into my manuscript was I talked about how I was a hot mess and I had baggage and my first husband was a hot mess and he had baggage. And I said, two addicts um, digging their own pit, uh, picking up a shovel to dig one together. And you added a monogrammed shovel because we were newlyweds. And I was like, that is brilliant. <laughs> That's I don't even remember before. doing that. Yeah, I and I even texted, texted you yesterday. It. I'm like, monogram shovel. Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> His and hers. His and her shovels. Yeah, there you we know, go. Like, hey, we're married now. Let's get to digging because that really is such a perfect <laughs> metaphor for our marriage. So. You guys are going to love this book, though. Seriously. Oh, my gosh. I can't wait. It's so good. It's I so can't good. wait, too, because I just know it's going to change lives. It's a story that will transform, to your point. And that's why God told me to tell it. Watch today for another Facebook Live. I'm actually going to go live and just talk about free and invite women to my free event. So that'll be coming up later on today um, here on Facebook. But I'll let you both go. You guys are girls, are women of action. You've got lots to do Mwah, to both of you. Don't forget to be extraordinary and tell your story. Tell your story. <laughs> Bye, guys. Bye.